Good afternoon, everybody. Um, happy Thursday. Um, I have one uh, one thing at the top, and then um, we're happy to dive right into your questions. Uh, we are aware that Iranian authorities may imminently execute Majid Kazimi and Saleh Mir Hashemi and Saeed Yakubi in connection with their participation in protests in Iran. We join the people of Iran and the international community in calling on Iran to not carry out these executions. The execution of these men after what have been widely regarded as sham trials would be an affront to human rights and basic dignity in Iran and everywhere. It is clear from this episode that the Iranian regime has learned nothing from the protests that began with another death, the death of Masa Amini in September of last year. We once again urge Iran's leadership to stop the killing, stop the sham trials, and respect people's human rights. We are continuing to work in close coordination with our allies and partners around the world to condemn and confront these appalling human rights abuses. Uh, and with that, Matt, happy to dive into uh, your questions. Okay, uh, I didn't have anything, but since you started with that, let me just um, <clears throat> ask you, um, these are the same cases that um, Special Envoy uh, Malley tweeted about earlier. Correct. Today. Correct. So yeah. Does that mean that he's he's now back? Um, I believe he is, uh, but I don't have a specific. I don't keep a, a metric of uh, when people okay. are on leave and, or not. And, and and none of these people uh, have any affiliation with the U.S. Do they? That is my understanding. Correct. Right. Uh, and then, uh, uh, well, that's it. Okay. Uh, staying on the Iran. Okay, then I'll come back to the wires. Gita, then I'll come to you, Alex. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so you said you the U.S. is speaking uh, with its allies and partners. Are they of the same view, and do you expect them to um, condemn uh, these, uh, you know, executions or, or possible executions? Uh, I'm not going to speak for our allies and partners, uh, Gita, but uh, when it comes to uh, confronting the challenge of the Iranian regime and its uh, the egregious human rights abuses, its continued support uh, f for Russia in the war in Ukraine, its provision of arms to proxies in the Middle East, there is convergence uh, between the United States in an, and our allies and partners in confronting the challenge faced by the Iranian regime. And so when it comes to holding them accountable, uh, we'll continue to do so. Uh, we'll continue to do so via coordinating uh, with our allies and partners. So on a related topic, um, about the um, prescription of the IRGC as a terrorist organization, Iranians inside and outside the country uh, have, a lo uh, have started a campaign long ago about Con trying to convince the UK government to do so. Um, even one Iranian British citizen has been on a hunger strike for about two months at least. Um, yes, a couple of days ago you were asked whether, um, what you think if the US has been talking to the UK about this, you've said that it's a sovereign decision, yes, but, but at the same time uh, you have repeatedly said, <clears throat> excuse me, that just like, just like now, that the U.S. does speak with its allies. And um, so what has the U.S. government been saying in this regard to the U.K. government? Sure. So on, on this, let me just say we, of course, support uh, putting more pressure on the IRGC to cease its destabilizing activities and involvement uh, in human rights abuses. Uh, it is, of course, up to each country uh, or up to blocks of countries to determine what action is applicable under their own various legal authorities uh, and what's, of course, in their own interest. And as you know, we've applauded the EU and the UK's recent designations of IRGC officials and entities for their involvement in not just human rights abuses, uh, but of course uh, the transfer of UAVs to Russia that Russia has since used to target Ukraine's critical infrastructure uh, and kill Ukrainian citizens. Uh, our viewpoint on this has been quite clear. Our position on the IRGC is that uh, we've designated them a uh, foreign terrorist organization and they are subject to more US sanctions than perhaps any other entity on the planet. Um, and so when it comes to continuing to hold the Iranian regime, including the IRGC accountable, we'll continue to coordinate and work closely with our uh, allies and partners in doing so. 
And so uh, those reports about the U.S. lobbying for the U.K. not to do it when you actually say that you do support, um, you know, IRGC being uh, under pressure. Those we, are we, of course, support putting more pressure on the IRGC, and it is up to each country and each block of country uh, to determine uh, what way to go about doing that. Alex, go Can ahead. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, we're having a hard time understanding why you cannot say on the record that you did not lobby the British government to refrain from recognizing Alex, uh, it should be no surprise to you who's covered the department for a long time and certainly not going to get into the specifics of uh, the diplomatic uh, discussions that we've had uh, with allies and partners. And when confronting the challenge uh, posed by the Iranian regime and the countering their malign activities that have impacts not just in the immediate region but in the international community broadly, uh, tackling that head on uh, requires close coordination with our allies and partners. And of course, in this instance, uh, you all are asking about the United Kingdom. Um, so I'm just not going to get uh, specific about uh, what those discussions are like other than to s reiterate what I've said is that when it comes to countering Iran's malign influence, uh, there is immense convergence uh, between our allies and partners in holding this uh, brutal regime accountable. And in the case of the IRGC, we of course welcome uh, efforts to put more pressure on them, uh, but the specific way to go about that is up to each individual country and block of country. Thank you. Back to Topper, you said uh -huh. rightfully that the Iranian regime has not learned from the protests. One thing they have learned, it looks like, that they can get away with it. They can murder. I, I would I would reject the, the, the premise of that question. I don't think the United States has um, uh, allowed them uh, to get away with it. In, it we have taken, uh, since the death of Masa Amini, since the immense protests that we've seen break out in Tehran and other parts of Iran, you have seen uh, this country, uh, in uh, al alignment with our allies and partners, take appropriate steps uh, to hold the Iranian regime accountable. Whether that be uh, direct sanctions on the human rights abusers, direct sanctions on security officials involved in some of these human rights abuses, bringing licenses on board with our colleagues at the Department of Treasury to allow the further flow of information within uh, uh, the Iranian people. We've not hesitated to take action. Uh, this is action we know is having a direct impact uh, on Iran, uh, both just as it relates uh, to their own country, but also the standing that it has in the international community. Will so they're not getting away with anything. Will the administration uh, sanction Iranian citizen leader? for this very action. Uh, again, Alex, I've never been in a place to uh, give you a list of uh, things that we uh, will or will not do uh, when it comes to holding uh, people accountable. We, we continue to have tools at our disposal to hold the Iranian regime accountable, and we've used those tools, and we've used them quite regularly. If you look, uh, dating back to uh, the fall of last year, just the regular clip of which we have uh, announced designations relating to the Iranian regime, uh, we've done so regularly consistently and in uh, close coordination with our allies and partners. Uh, my, my last one on this, uh, just to follow up, uh, you, you mentioned the, the tools. Uh, my last question, I promise. Uh, sure. You probably are aware of the Masa Act is being uh, considered on the Hill, uh, which will allow the administration to sanction high-ranking Iranian officials. Does the administration support Legislative Alex, I'm just not going to uh, get into something that is pending legislation that's still being uh, discussed in Congress. Saeed, go ahead. <laughs> to clarify something yeah. uh, that you just said. You said that uh, you have, uh, that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, has been, uh, there are more sanctions than any other entity on earth, more so than Russia. I mean, you know, you have like 14,000 sanctions uh, on the Russian. I, I believe what I said it is uh, perhaps than any other entity on the planet. I don't have, I don't keep a sanctions list in my back pocket to, uh, to cross-reference. Uh, I will say, though, that I feel pretty confident saying that the IRGC is, in fact, one of the most uh, designated in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, re the Russian Federation, especially in light of their recent activities mm -hmm. uh, over the past year in Ukraine, continues to be um, uh, something that this administration will continue to uh, take steps to hold uh, accountable as well. Uh, go ahead. The head of the Syrian regime will be walking to a big hall tomorrow in Jeddah uh, at the Arab Summit League. What's your take on that? And especially one of your important allies in the region uh, invited him for the summit, and most likely they are naturalizing 
the relationship with the regime. So I spoke a little bit about this yesterday, and I will reiterate uh, what I said that, uh, and what you heard the secretary say. Uh, we do not believe that um, Syria uh, should be affronted at, at re-entry into the Arab League. Um, of course, uh, we are not a party to the Arab League, so um, this is a decision for the body to make. Uh, and as it relates to normalization, we don't support normalization uh, with the Assad regime, and we don't support uh, our partners doing so. That being said, uh, we have a number of shared objectives uh, as it relates to um, the Syrian regime. Uh, one of those pieces, of course, is uh, bringing home Austin Tice. Another piece of that is ensuring that uh, ISIS uh, does not reemerge and continue to have destabilizing impact in the region. Uh, another piece of that is ensuring that we can counter the illicit captagon trade in Syria. These are all objectives we know are shared by our partners in the Arab world. Uh, and why, by, while we might disagree in the ways about going to get there, uh, we know and we hope that our Arab partners will use uh, these avenues to raise these directly uh, with the Syrian regime. So it is okay for the administration or top officials to meet secretly with Syrians in Oman, like the last uh, the last meeting, to talk about Austin Tice. That's appropriate, right? You heard me say from, from here yesterday that uh, the U.S. is willing to engage with anyone who can help secure the progress toward the release of U.S. nationals. Even the U.S. officials themselves to meet with Syrian delegations. I, I think I'm, I'm very clear in what I'm saying. All right, Leon, you had your hand up. I look. On, on can I go to? I'll come to you right after. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Michelle. Go ahead. Can you respect the release of Austin Tice after the uh, Arab uh, summit? What I will say, Michelle, is that we are working um, uh, around the clock. We continue to engage extensively to bring Austin home. Uh, this, of course, includes uh, discussing this case with uh, a number of countries in the region. We have pursued every channel. We will continue to pursue every channel to seek his safe return to his family. And uh, one more, uh, the Syrian regime is saying in uh, Jeddah that uh, he took all the necessary steps and decisions related to the uh, refugees returned to Syria. But the problem is the uh, sanctions that prevent the reconstruction of Syria. My question is, are you planning to lift the sanctions on Syria to allow the reconstruction and the return of the refugees? Well, let me be very clear that uh, we intend to stand by our core sanctions principle, and we've been clear about that with our partner countries in the region. Uh, we will not normalize uh, relations with the Assad regime, and our sanctions uh, efforts uh, will remain in full effect. Uh, that being said, we do share the objective of creating safe conditions within Syria for the eventual uh, safe return of refugees, um, and we'll continue to work uh, on that in uh, accordance with our partners in the Arab world. Leon, go ahead. I'm sorry for no, 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 passing no, you no, over no, first. A change of subject. Yeah, uh, go ahead. The Armenian Azerbaijan talks yeah. in Moscow at the ministerial level. Um, so the, the two ministers were here not mm -hmm. so long ago, about 10 days ago, one or two weeks ago. Uh, there was progress made, but there was obviously no uh, conclusion to those talks, and so now they're ongoing in Moscow, and Moscow has invited the two leaders to Moscow uh, in end of May, I think. Um, the Armenian prime minister has accepted. I don't know about his counterpart from Azerbaijan, but my, I, was, I was wondering, I mean, how does the State Department of the United States view those talks in Moscow and Russia's role in these talks, given the context, of course, of the war in Ukraine. Well, and, we, and we continue to provide full support and engagement of the United States uh, as these two countries work to secure a durable uh, and dignified uh, peace. Uh, we welcome the reports that the parties are going to continue to engage in these discussions. And we reiterate that our conviction that peace is within reach and that direct dialogue is key to resolving these issues. Our view is that direct talks between the parties are of utmost importance, uh, and we're glad to see them happen uh, and take place, whether they are taking place in Arlington, in Brussels, in Moscow. Uh, uh, our uh, support with this effort uh, will continue to endure. Okay, and just to follow up, are, are there any back channels with Moscow uh, on this, uh, Moscow on these talks, uh, sharing information between the U.S. and Washington on these? Uh, uh, Leon, I'm not, uh, without getting uh, into specific uh, diplomatic engagements, of course, uh, uh, 
one of the many reasons why we continue uh, to maintain um, um, bilateral relations with Russia, even in a time of uh, immense uh, uh, tension, uh, is uh, because there are, of course, issues uh, between uh, our two countries that uh, we need to ensure are uh, talked about responsibly, appropriately, uh, and so I will just leave it at that. Simon, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So a group of U.S. senators uh, is introducing a, a bill called the No Start Treaty Act that would um, recommend withdrawing from from New Start. Um, I'm guessing you're not going to comment directly on on you know pending legis potential legislation or you know, uh, that element of it. But but since they're suggesting, um, basically they're suggesting that. Russia has already uh, withdrawn itself from the treaty or, or, or said it, it, it will no longer um, uh, comply with, with the requirements of the treaty. Uh, is the, administration, the administration's intention to continue to comply with the treaty where the other side uh, is basically saying we don't respect this anymore? We, we are complying with the treaty, and, and Russia's decision to unilaterally suspend its participation in New START uh, is unfortunate and irresponsible. You heard the secretary speak to this quite clearly. Uh, our view is that mutual compliance of New START strengthens security interests of not just the United States, but our allies and partners. It strengthens the security interests of Russia and the rest of the world as well. And that's why we are continuing to work to preserve the treaty. I've not seen this legislation, so I, of course, am not uh, going to comment on it. Uh, but uh, we think the world is better off when both of our countries are in compliance of uh, New START. And is it still your view that the Russians are in compliance in terms of the limits of the treaty rather than uh, other aspects of the treaty, but in terms of the, the, the limits it actually puts on? Uh, that is my, that is correct. Sure, thank you. All right. Uh, Olivia, go ahead. Um, has it been determined how many U.S. government employees were killed in the attack on the convoy? So it has not been uh, determined. We've not been able to uh, ascertain that information. That could potentially take some time and may require some additional steps, uh, such as uh, DNA testing. What I can add is that uh, uh, it's our assessment that the assailants killed uh, at least four, but probably seven members of the convoy. Uh, but again, uh, we are not at a place where we can ascertain um, uh, how many of those were uh, our personnel or not. That's seven out of nine Correct. entirely. So what is the status of the other victims? Is there a search ongoing? Is there a presumption they've been kidnapped? Or there is. We are continuing to work urgently to uh, ascertain the location of the other convoy members. Okay. On a separate topic, yeah. if I may, um, has the department received a response from the House Foreign Affairs Committee to its letter regarding the dissent panel cable yesterday? Uh, I'm not aware of a, of a formal response back. Yeah. Okay. There were close remarks by the chairman. Um, yesterday indicating he's amenable, he's encouraged by the offer, but would like it to be expanded to the entirety of the committee. Is that something that the State Department would entertain? Uh, I will look forward to receiving a, a, a formal response from the uh, committee, and uh, we'll take it uh, one step at a time. I'm not going to uh, speculate uh, further from here. But if the final compromise is to expand the universe of people who can see this from two to more than 50, is that something that you think the Department would sign off on? I think in, uh, it is natural in these discussions for there to be uh, deliberations and accommodations about the path forward, and I'm certainly just not going to um, speculate and uh, hypothesize on um, uh, how we continue to further engage with the committee. What I will reiterate, though, is that at every turn we have offered um, uh, tangible uh, fair uh, and uh, realistic uh, accommodations that uh, we think have sufficiently met and continue to sufficiently meet the committee's request for information. Uh, and I'll remind that at this, from at up until this point, uh, we have already offered a classified briefing. We have offered a written summary of the uh, dissent channel cable and uh, the department's response. Um, and uh, additionally, uh, we have now made the uh, offer that we uh, that I shared with you all yesterday for uh, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Meeks to uh, come to the department and view a, uh, a, a version of the cable with personal information redacted. So continue to uh, engage with the committee, but I, I, I don't want to get ahead of the process. Yeah. Still don't know the motivation for the attack. Is that right? Uh, our assessment still is that uh, the there's no uh, evidence to, to point to that these uh, this convoy was targeted due to its affiliation with the United States or the U.S. mission. Yeah. Goyle, go ahead. Uh, thank you. 
answer two questions, please, one on India and one Pakistan. Sure. As far as the recently released uh, religious report, it is talked of the town in India and the media and also government, uh, the foreign ministry is saying that this was a propaganda against India by some groups in the U.S. or outside which uh, have or has not been properly investigated by the State Department. And, uh, and what the ministry is saying that uh, India is a rule of law and uh, freedom of religion and worship of law and all that like in the U.S. But at the same time, Mr. Sudhir Chaudhary of the Aj Tak TV channel, mm -hmm. he highlighted the report in a very vigorous way and he's saying that uh, Hindus or BJP was named in the report many, 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 many times or maybe more than 100 times. But PFI, which is a, a Muslim organization who has killed so many people in India, only one time and they received funding from the uh, NGOs and anti-India groups or I ISI or among others. Yeah. What he said that what kind of message that uh, State Department or U.S. is sending to India or the people of India. I'm, I'm going to jump in, Goyal, because I think I, I have a, a sense of where you're going with this. Um, let, let me say broadly that we carefully monitor the religious freedom situation in any country, and we encourage each government to uphold its commitments to protect religious freedom, to protect human rights for all, uh, and officials from the Secretary and the President on down engage regularly on steps to uh, that they can take uh, and engage with their counterparts on to advance uh, religious freedom uh, and human rights. Uh, again, we strongly oppose laws and actions around the world that impede the ability of any individuals uh, to uh, practice a faith, choose their faith, uh, participate uh, in religion in, in any which way. Second on Pakistan, sure. sir, I'm sure you must be watching or the State Department must be watching what's going on in Pakistan right now. Uh, Imran Khan, uh, he has been called that he is a traitor and he should be put to death by the National Assembly in Pakistan. And now uh, all the action is in Lahore where uh, Imran Khan is there, police and military and all that. What my skill is that Imran Khan is talking about breaking of Pakistan and all that. And uh, now he said he will be killed. So how much, uh, where, uh, how much uh, we have to believe in media, in uh, TV or there, and what is the reality? What is the actual? Are you getting any information or your embassy in Pakistan? Uh, which this is, is because Lahore well, is not far well, away from Islamabad. A, uh, this is a situation that is uh, internal uh, to Pakistan. And as you have heard me say before, uh, the United States does not choose a particular candidate or a political party uh, uh, in Pakistan. Our view is that uh, a strong, prosperous, secure Pakistan is key to U.S.-Pakistan uh, bilateral relations, uh, but I don't have any other comments to add on the uh, situation there. Yes, Say, you've had your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, very quick question. Um, the, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz reported that uh, the Israeli <coughs> finance minister, Smotrich, <coughs> has asked to prepare for 500,000 more settlers in the West Bank and, and the settlements and his legal outpost. And I know the position of this administration and settlement, but what measures are you willing to take to deter or to dissuade him from pursuing this? Said, we, Actual we, we regularly engage with Israeli officials on, uh, uh, on this issue and will continue to do so. You've heard me say this before, that uh, like most administrations previously, we view the expansion of settlements as an obstacle to peace that undermines the geographic viability of a two-state solution. And we continue to oppose any unilateral steps that incite tensions, harm trust between the parties, and undermine this viability of a two-state solution. So if in fact they begin to you know, allocate funds and so on to pursue this goal, uh, would you say that, that is unacceptable to the United States of America? Would you declare such a thing as being unacceptable? Said, we have been clear and have not parsed ver words that uh, uh, actions such as these, <clears throat> like the expansion of settlements, uh, they undermine uh, the ultimate goal, uh, our ultimate goal for the region, which is a two-state solution. And we raise this issue directly with our Israeli partners, with our partners in the Palestinian Authority, and we will continue to do so. All right. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, today, Chinese embassy in Tokyo has delivered grave concern to Japanese government, saying the G7 summit is taking negative posture against China. 
And at the same time, Chinese foreign ministry also criticized the uh, United States and Japan that they have responsibility to growing tension in Taiwan Strait. So I'm wondering if you would, uh, how, how you would react to this allegation. The G7 uh, is about tackling the many pressing global challenges that are in front of us. And it is about the world's uh, uh, most advanced economies uh, working together through international cooperation to address some of these very uh, serious challenges, whether that be addressing climate change, whether that be addressing health insecurity, food insecurity, uh, Russia's uh, barbaric and unjust war in Ukraine. Uh, the G7 is not about one country or another. It is about what uh, these collective economies can do uh, as a whole uh, in partnership uh, for the world, for the international community. And that is what uh, you are going to see President Biden, Secretary Blinken, and other leaders who are there right now uh, reiterate uh, in their engagements uh, while in Hiroshima. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Let me get your reaction quickly to Russia's freezing Finnish embassies, bank accounts, in response to what is called unfriendly actions of the West. Uh, I've not seen those reports, so um, I don't have any assessment to offer. Uh, broadly, though, um, Russia should uh, make sure that it uh, obliges with uh, appropriate um, auspices under the Vienna Convention as it relates to whatever engagements that they have with this particular diplomatic facility. But Thank I'm not gonna, I, I'm not aware of this, so I don't have anything else to offer. Thanks so much. And back yeah. to Karabakh, if you don't mind. Um, not to beat around the bush, I'm just curious, uh, how confident are you that the Moscow process will serve in terms of carrying out the peace process for, for to the desirable outcome. We're talking about different format, different, you know, mediator. Uh, do you have any concern that given Russian officials? I'm just not going to prescribe or hypothesize or speculate from here, Alex. Uh, our view is that the countries, uh, that peace between the countries is possible, uh, and the U.S. continues to welcome and work towards a durable and dignified uh, peace in this case. And don't have any notes. I'm going to go to Leon. Uh, uh, just, just, well, just one clarification, uh, because uh, this question was asked previously. Uh -huh. Ambassador Riker was on the record last fall saying that he tried to reach out to his Russian colleagues, and they did not return his call. I'm just wondering if. Uh, Special Advisor Bono has done the same. And where is he these days since the end of Washington? He continues to be deeply engaged in this issue, as you know, Alex. Um, I don't have dip specific dip diplomatic calls to reach out, but again, I'll reiterate that uh, we found the uh, uh, talks that we hosted uh, in early May uh, as constructive. Uh, the parties themselves uh, agreed to certain terms and believe have a better understanding of each other's points of view. Uh, we continue to welcome the continued dialogue um, on this. Leon. Yeah, I was wondering if you had any concerns about uh, the uh, summit that's taking place uh, today and tomorrow, I think, in China with the five uh, Central Asian republics. Um, there's a big push, obviously, by China uh, to create ties with these uh, five republics, which are moving a little bit away uh, from Moscow, given the war in Ukraine yeah. and all that. I know, obviously, the secretary was there not so long ago in these two of these uh, republics. But uh, should the U.S. be concerned about this summit, and and should you be doing a little bit more in terms of uh, trying to reel in these uh, five? Uh, Leon, we've been doing a lot. Uh, I will let um, I will let the PRC I will let the PRC uh, and the C five countries uh, speak to their own uh, engagements. These are sovereign decisions for them to undertake on their own. But uh, we strive to be a reliable par and steadfast partner to countries in Central Asia, uh, as you so noted, uh, Secretary Blinken in Astana. In um, I think it was. March, uh, had the opportunity to uh, convene uh, a C5 ministerial. Uh, that was, at, at that point, his fourth uh, engagement uh, with uh, the C5 in two years. He previously had the opportunity to host uh, the C5 on the margins of, of UNGA High Level Week, as well as um, hosting a virtual convening in um, the early months of, of 2021. Uh, we look forward to continuing to collaborate with uh, Central Asian partners 
partners on a number of bilateral issues, whether that be um, strengthening our cooperation uh, in the energy sector. Uh, there is, of course, a, a security nexus um, given their proximity in certain regions of the world, uh, as well as deepening uh, our important people-to-people -people ties, as well as deepening uh, important trade relationships as well. Um, I will also note that when Secretary Blinken was uh, in um, Astana and Uzbekistan earlier in this year, uh, we were uh, uh, happy to launch uh, $45 million of US-funded uh, economic resilience initiative in Central Asia to diversify some of these many issues that I was talking about, Central Asia's trade routes, expand investment in the region, uh, increase employment opportunities. Um, so our engagement uh, with uh, Central Asia continues to be robust. Um, uh, I, I, the examples I have given are just uh, from what the Secretary has done, but others in this department continue to be deeply engaged, yeah, yes, as does the Secretary. That, that's what I mean. You yeah. just said $45 million compared to a lot more money being engaged by China on the Silk Route and, and things like that. Um, and this is a summit, obviously, at the leader's level. Uh, and the Chinese leader has pinned it as uh, you know, a new, new era, a new opening. So are you, uh, question is, are you concerned about that? And, and do you have to step it up? We are uh, very confident about the, the the engagement and the inroads that we continue to make uh, in Central Asia, specifically through um, the C5, and we look forward to continuing to uh, engage with the region. Uh, Simon, go ahead. I wanted to uh, move to the uh, Pacific Islands. Which sure. Is the, um, the, the Secretary is <laughs> yeah. supposed to be in, or will, will be in Papua New Guinea. Um, uh, the last couple of days, there have been announcements of, of um, that you guys have agreed uh, to renew these compact of free association agreements with uh, Micronesia and now Palau. Um, we believe the Marshall Islands is the is the outstanding one that you're trying to um, get agreed. Uh, I wonder if you could sort of explain um, what's the sticking point there? Why why haven't you been able to get an agreement with the Marshall Islands so far? Um, and do you think you can can get that agreed so that something could be signed when the secretary is there? Uh, I'm certainly not going to get ahead of the, the secretary's trip. We, of course, look forward to uh, his trip to uh, uh, the U.S. Pacific Islands Forum um, in Port Mosby. Um, and as it relates to your question about the COFA, I mean, I'm going to have to check with the team and, and get back to you, see if we have any additional information yeah, for you there. Actually, is that, is that, is the premise of the question correct? I thought all three of them were done, and basically what's waiting, waiting is congressional approval for the money. Uh, well, I'll have to double check on that, Simon, and can get back to you. Um, okay. Sure, Said. Jeddah Summit. Yeah. Uh, in the past, uh, American diplomats uh, participated in, in these summits. Do we know who's participating? I so talked about this last week. I said that uh, oh, Assistant oh, Secretary sorry. Molly Fee and Ambassador Godfrey uh, are uh, leading uh, the U.S. delegation to Jeddah, and they continue to be uh, deeply engaged in that process. Are you talking about the air? Are you talking I'm about talking the, the about Sudan talks? The, the I'm talking about the Jeddah summit. My apologies. My apologies. Because, my you know, apologies. I, I know that. Uh, uh, I will. Understood. My apologies. I, I right. assumed you were talking about the talks relating no. Sudan. Um, I will have to check. I'll check and, and get back to you on that. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, thanks, no, everybody. No, hold on. Mm -hmm. Before we go. All right. I have someone with a logistical question. It's not a policy question. Well, it actually might be a I policy love these. question. Yeah, uh, and and bear with me where I'm going. Have you looked at your? Uh, have you gotten any emails from any of your colleagues uh, in the last? You know, before you came out here, obviously not while you've been at the podium, but since about noon or so. Uh, I, I I I. Why don't you get to your question? Okay. And then <laughs> have you? Have you? What's your do you, question? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you have? Are you able to look at them right now? My email. Yeah. I'm not going to pull up my email from the podium. No, no, no. You don't need to yeah. show it to me. <laughs> yeah. I want to notice. I, I, I want to know if you've noticed anything different in the from line, where it gives the sender. M Matt, this would be a lot better if you would just All ask right, us I'll what your ask, question I, was. I, well, I mean, you, so you haven't noticed anything? No. Okay. So within the last hour and a half, two hours, the State Department's internal email system, and I've tested this, so okay. I know that it's true, has added pronouns to people's, uh, not their signature, but to their, uh, from where, where, you know, where it says from. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it will say him, he, his, or her, you know, her, yeah. she, hers. Um, 
<clears throat> why? Uh, this is not an optional thing. This is something that has been just ar arbitrarily imposed. And I you know, understand that people could have their pronouns attached if they wanted them to a signature before. But this is not something that anyone has a choice about. And so I'm just wondering why and who, who made this decision. Well, Matt, I um, have not seen this uh, phenomenon for myself. Okay, well, um, I have, uh, and I'll show it to you. And as is it just, so let me, to ask you a question, is it just for uh, internal State Department uh, Obviously not, because out? I tested it. So I got, when, I got if an you email send from an email? someone in this building, and, 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 and whereas before it did not have any of these pronouns attached to the uh, sender's name, it now does. And I've also been told from other people that that, that many of them, or at least well, when you two send or three, it, does it does it have the the? I'll show it to you okay. in a second. Well, I what I will say, just if you say, don't know anything about this, then that that's fine. Yeah. Can you look into it? Because I'd like I'm to happy, know why. I'm happy to look into it. Why what this I will would just, not be an optional thing for people to do. But the problem is, is that a lot of them, or at least some of them, so far as far as I've been able to tell, are wrong. They're giving the wrong. Pronoun. I again. So men not, are being identified as women and women as I've, men, and this has nothing to do with whatever transgender I have or not any, seen, any anything like that. What, but, but it's ridiculous. This this phenomenon has not made its way to my outlook, but I, I will. Well, I'm happy to check I've on this for you. I just told you about it. So uh, uh, can you broadly can, though, can you get Matt. An broadly though, out? Matt. Of course, uh, the ability um, for individuals to. I don't have a problem to, with doing it, it and if people want to have their. Okay. Pro there are whatever pronoun on attached it is fine but it should be a choice right not not something that is the the, the, the state department imposes on Th people thank especially you, if it's wrong i will look into this i'm not aware right. uh, thanks everybody Bye. happy thursday